welcome to today's workshop. So I'm pretty excited about this one. It's going to be a good one. So today we are covering programming for sports performance. So we have one of our APE coaches, Cara McConnell, is going to take the workshop. She is, so Cara is the head of our S&C department at APEC. And she, so she designs sorry, a lot of the education content that's on the course. And she's also out in the field with a number of our different teams as well. So she's responsible for the education side of things. And she's out there in the trenches as well, working with you guys. So it's going to be a great lecture with loads of real world insight and experience. So I won't take up too much more of your time. I'm going to turn you over to Cara now. Cara, the floor is all yours. Perfect. So yeah, as uh, Shane said, my name is Cara. Um, and a few of you might know me already from either previous webinars or else the Instagram lives. Um, but today's online workshop, we're going to focus on programming for sports performance. Um, so the format for today, I'll just first introduce myself just to give a bit of a background about myself for anyone that doesn't know me, just so you kind of know like who is this person just lecturing me and um, just to give you a bit of context about myself. I'll then introduce the subject for today and go over the learning outcomes and then we'll get into the actual topic and um, we're going to cover needs analysis, screening, testing, we'll talk about planning the calendar and then what we do from there. So just starting off a bit about myself and um, I went to UCD and I did my Bachelor of Science in Sport and Exercise Management and through UCD I started interning as an SNC coach um, and then I went on to do my diploma in strength conditioning with APEC once I finished my course in UCD. Through that and through my kind of internship and just over the last number of years I've worked with a variety of sports um, hockey, Gaelic football, camogie um, and a bit of rugby as well. Um, so I've worked with the Kula ladies team and um, both their football and camogie team. Um, I've worked with the Pembroke Wanderers senior ladies and um, done the underage, some underage work with uh, Leinster hockey, the under 16s and under 18s and the same with the Irish hockey just on the girls side of things. Um, and then I also kind of work with general population clients in um, a gym up in Sandyford. So just with kind of this functional fitness style working out. And um, I'm also in St. Jared's School at the moment too, um, dealing with all the hockey side of s &C. So that's just to give you a bit of context around me and my background, just so I'm not this complete randomer talking to you guys. Um, and then hopefully, so about today's topic, from our online modules, you should already have kind of a good understanding of our like PAA system of programming and designing sessions. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is probably more the the practical aspect around designing a program or the steps we kind of do prior to actually putting pen to paper. One really important thing I think we need to keep in mind is creating context for our program because it's not the like most efficient use or the best use of our time. If we just, we start off with a new team and we just throw them into the program without really knowing the players themselves, their training age, their biological age, and um, their training level, or even um, knowing the sport really. So if it's a completely new sport to you and you just, maybe you've worked with one particular sport your whole life or over your coaching career, then you're into a new sport, you don't really know anything about it. These are things that you can do um, to kind of just help make your program the most effective and efficient that it can be. So from today, my aim of today's kind of webinar is to provide you with um, a checklist or a set of guidelines that you can follow whenever you start working with a new team or athlete. And obviously, when we do that and we take these steps prior to programming, we're going to get gain the ability to create context for that program to be in, as I've said. We do need to remember the importance of being a systems based coach. And I hope that this webinar will give you the ability um, and kind of maybe some inspiration to form your own system surrounding the design of your athletic performance program. Um, I also wanted to show you how I lay out my coaching bits and bobs like my program my calendar and um, how I just do general things because when I was coaching and when I was kind of starting into coaching 
I probably learned most um, most of what I know now from other coaches and seeing what other coaches did in their programs or even in their layouts, like on their spreadsheets if they use them, how they did things that way. Um, so I'm going to show you some like images or screenshots from one of my programs from one of the school teams. Um, and then hopefully that'll give you kind of a bit of inspiration, like, oh, that's a good way to lay that out. Because I find sometimes when you're put in front of this, this blank spreadsheet and you need to form something or design something, you're kind of a bit, you don't know where to start. Um, so I just hope that this can give you a bit of inspiration, first of all, to create your own step-by-step -step approach. And then of course, to um, just take your own kind of um, way with things and inspire you to create your own little format. And um, so the different components of that checklist or guidelines that I was talking about, the step-by-step -step approach, is our needs analysis, our screening and testing, and then our calendar planning. Um, that thing we just need to keep in mind throughout this whole webinar is the importance of creating context for the program. It might not be the most glamorous aspect of strength and conditioning, but it definitely is one of the most important aspects. So we just need to keep that in mind. So just everything I'm talking about today, it goes back to creating context. Um, so the first important step we should carry out is of course our needs analysis. Our needs analysis, um, it's probably the most important, it's like to give us a background on the sport. So it's going to let us understand the sport that we're programming for. We're going to take into account and record every aspect of the sport from what sort of equipment they use, if any, to what kind of injuries are pretty common in the sport. The detail um, that we put into this is going to impact our understanding of the sport, which is then will underpin the quality of the program that we design or we create. The better we understand um, the sport kind of makes our program or the more specific our program can be. This is kind of very important as well if it's a sport you didn't know. When I started off with hockey, I played hockey for about a year when I was like 14. So I didn't really know a huge amount of even the rules or how long a match was. So I had to go and do a good bit of research, background research, just so I knew what I was programming for and what kind of um, demands were put on the, on the athletes when they were playing. So it's particularly important when you don't know a sport. Everything we do here in our needs analysis is going to directly feed into the type of testing and any monitoring that we choose to do with our athletes or with the team. And then it's obviously going to come into play in our program as well. Um, these are some, they don't have to be, it's not a definitive list, but these are some of the components I would include in our needs analysis. Um, it will vary sport to sport. You might want to add things in, you might want to take stuff out. Um, it's going to depend on you and the sport that you're working with. So starting off very basic, um, do they use any sort of equipment? Do the players wear any protective padding? Do they use a hockey stick? Like, is it a tennis racket? Like, what do they use? Um, and what's going to, do they have to wear a gum shield? What's, what's going to come into play there? Then I'd look at the field of play. So what type of surface they play on? Maybe is there more than one type of surface and um, how this could potentially affect their performance and as well as the type of surface I'd maybe look at um, the size of the field of play and how it's divided so is it into halves is it into quarters and um, is like in hockey is there the d like what's what what does the actual field of play look like and then um, I would look at the different positions there are um, are players required to play in more than one sort of position? Do the demands of play change according to position? Um, I would just go through everything and it doesn't have to be like in a, a really specific sense. It could just be goalie backs forwards rather than goalie, say like full forwards, half forwards, mids, half backs, full backs. Like it doesn't have to be totally in detail. Um, you can if you want, but that's just definitely up to you and what you find will benefit you most. I then look into the duration of the match. Um, is it split into halves or quarters? How long is there between each? Um, I would also maybe consider does it go into extra time and the rules surrounding that? Is it golden goal? 
um, is it silver goal? What kind of playing rules come into that and what's going to affect the duration of play? I then look into substitutions. How many are typically made in a match? Um, maybe how long each sub will be out or for? Is it limited substitutions? Is it unlimited? And from this, you can kind of try and determine the work to rest ratio. And then um, that's going to help you kind of figure out what the energy system it predominantly uses in the sport. I would then look at common areas of injuries and maybe some risk factors that come into play. And then that can help you program in your prehab work um, or maybe in the warm up or in some extra home um, programs that they follow. You can help to make them more robust players when you know that this is a common area of injury in the sport. OK, we need to work to kind of protect, say if it's the knee, we need to work to protect that joint. Um, rather than if, if the common area in the sport is the knees and you program like shoulder shoulder prehab, it's we just need to make sure that it's specific and it's going in line with our needs analysis. And then the last thing, I wouldn't really get too hung up about this, but it is good to know um, is the playing technique or some sort of some playing techniques of the sport. I'm not saying have an in-depth knowledge, um, but just in a broad sense, know kind of what's required of the players, maybe in different defense and offensive styles. So um, maybe if, the, if your coach comes to you and it's like, I want them to play full press, and um, what do you think? So, and then you know, you're able to tell them, okay, full press, I need to be really fit. But they're not, they're not there yet. But you, you know, kind of in a broad sense, in a general sense, what is required of the players in that kind of style of play. Um, and then this is just an example of a needs analysis that I've done for hockey. Um, it's very, it's very in depth. Um, it might be a bit overboard, but I, I like planning and being planned out to T. So this is what I find it really helps me. Um, as I said, it doesn't have to be as detailed as this. It could be really basic. Um, it's just what you what you need as a coach and to help you form a program that's really effective. So I, you can see kind of on the left here, I've picked the different components to research. And um, so I just went and just did quite a bit of research um, into, read some articles, read some um, hockey forums, just, just different things to get, to kind of fill out and build up this uh, needs analysis. Um, you can see I have equipment, I have like outfielders and goalkeepers, what they have to use, the different fields of play. And it's, there's a, a little bit of kind of information, water-based pitch, very fast, um, sandfield pitch, very hard surface, and that can impact kind of girls can start to suffer shin splints, your players can start to suffer shin splints. So I've just kind of included quite a bit, the match length substitution, it's unlimited energy systems are kind of just listed them um, and then injuries and you can see that I've see the hand and wrist, wrist facial concussions all contact we can't really like help that and um, but ankle sprain quadrant hamstring strain knee injuries and um, overuse injuries as well we can help with load management so that's all stuff that we can kind of kind of um, improve or ben uh, be beneficial for um, as I said, I did not know hockey. So this was really, really useful for me to do. And it's really important for you guys to do if you don't know the sport or if you sort of know the sport, but you don't know that in depth. Um, and this all just comes back to creating the context for your program. So you know actually what you're programming for. Um, but yeah, you guys do what you think is best and what suits you best. That's kind of the key here. So now we know our sport, we know the different ins and outs of it, it's time that we get to know our players. And the different ways we do this is with screening and with testing. So I generally do screening first and testing either just when you start your program or just before you start your program to get a baseline reading and then we can retest further down the line. So typically with elite level athletes, you will be working as part of a team. Um, so your screening can be very in-depth and quite individualized. But for most of us who do work in maybe amateur sport or sports play at a lower level, we do need to take a bit of a different approach 
Um, we need to be able to run through our movement screening or our battery of movement screens really effectively and very efficiently as well. But I suppose it can, you can guess the point where you're like, how do I do this? It's, it's me, there's 25 athletes in front of me, what am I gonna do? So I would definitely use screening that might identify more than one issue. Um, and that's just gonna help reduce the amount of tests that you need to do, if that makes sense. Because if you can identify from one movement, um, a lower body issue and an upper body issue, then we don't have, that's one test rather than doing two separate tests. And then as well as this, I would, when I'm screening athletes, I typically would have multiple athletes do the same movement at the same time. Probably stick to three athletes um, and no more than that, just because it can get, if you have like six different athletes, you could be, uh, you take longer to like look at them all. So I just do three, focus on the three, write a quick note on each. So keep them doing the movement until you've written a note on the three of them. Say if it's even just player one, uh, they're doing a squat, heels lifting, and um, player two, knees caving, player three, perfect squat. So I would just do quick, quick little jot down of one or two lines on each of the players. Um, and then probably the biggest piece of advice I could give you, and maybe sound like the most negative piece of advice, um, is prepare for the worst case scenario. And what I mean by this is prepare to carry out the screening on your own. And so don't be depending on another one or two coaches being there with you. If they're there, then that's great. But more often than not, it probably will just be you and you just do need to be prepared for this and be able to run through the screening just on your own. What I'd like to do, or what I like to do as well, is use our screening exercises and bring them into the warm up or even as extras in the actual session. Um, maybe as part of a prehab or as part of filler exercises. A wall angel is a really good one to just um, superset as a bit of a filler exercise um, with an upper body exercise. So especially if you're working, if the players are working in pairs, one person could be doing that, the other person could be doing um, their main exercise. Um, this is gonna help you casually monitor them without having to do a big screening day. So you can still monitor how they're doing if, if you've prescribed them extra work to be doing to improve those movements. You're, you're able to see them do them nearly every day. Maybe if you're with them or three times a week, you're able to see them do those movements. And then these are slight, maybe slight overboard again, um, but these are some screening movements or, that I've done and that I like to do. It's definitely not all of them. Um, they might chop and change depending on the sport, but this is a screenshot from my um, spreadsheet that I was talking to you guys about. So these are the ones I find to be very effective with the large group of athletes. Um, so we have the movement on the left, then in the middle, I just have kind of areas of concern, so things to look out for. And then I have scoring as well. Um, so scoring, I have that um, zero being, they get zero points, that is the pain, they have any pain or they can't complete it. One, there is a major um, kind of impairment in the movement. Two, there's a minor, minor issue, maybe a bit of a compensation. Three, that is perfect movement. It's very rare to get threes, especially with younger athletes, as I'm sure some of you know if you've worked with younger athletes before. And um, just due to the population, that's the kind of characteristic of them. Um, but yeah, it's just good. You can do your own little system. You could come up with your own scoring system. Um, but that's just to give you a bit of idea of how I lay it all out. So it's just nice and easy. Just I can flick over to, even on your phone, you can flick over to it, look look at the different things, use the different areas of concern and scoring. This is really useful as well if you have another coach with you that you can show them and then they can they can like look out for these little areas. So um, we've done our screening then. The second way of getting to know our athletes is by testing. So carrying out fat fitness testing is um, a way that we can show what we're accomplishing. And it means that we have evidence to show the sports coaches as to how their athletes are getting on, um, or maybe if some are lacking or some are doing really, really well. Sometimes your coaches might actually include you 
in various decisions, whether that's regarding should an athlete play at the weekend or maybe do some athletes need a break. Um, so having the data that you can show to your coach is really, really useful for this because you can be like, yeah, actually such and such they're um even their rpe or how they're they're not improving anymore so there's there's obviously some sort of issue here um and as well as this it comes into play with kind of showing you how effective your program is so if you don't track where your athletes start and where they are now how do you know if your program is working so how do you know if they're improving in their either strength fitness um how like there's just no way to know or we could probably guess by looking at them but at least you have actual facts and figures as to how much they're improving by um over time we should should see trends of improvement and if we don't see that that's when the program maybe needs tweaked or like if it's across the board or maybe if it's only a few athletes maybe they're slacking off or on the other side of that maybe they're overloaded and they need a break. Um, whatever the case is, we do need to do something with the data. Um, well, some coaches do, they do loads of testing, but the data never comes, they just like look at the data and the, it never gets reflected in the program if there's changes or not. Um, so you just do need to keep in mind if we need to change things, reduce workload, increase workload, whatever it is, we're just making sure that we're actually using the data and putting it to good use. We also might find that working with um, other coaches, they might not be too familiar with how athletic performance data is presented. So you could show the spreadsheet to someone, it could just be a load of numbers and they're kind of like, okay, what does this, what does this mean? Um, so I just always like try and present it in a really digestible, easily digestible format. And that can be the use of color blocking, or even just spacing it out just to make it appealing looking and kind of easy to discern what you're trying to say and what you're showing. Um, something that I like to do as well is have different standards of different tests. Um, so this way you can see where your athletes fall. So you might have level one, level two or level three. And you can just say that, yeah, we have um, most of the athletes are in level one or level two. But we have a couple of athletes that are down there in level three. We need to do extra work with them. And that's an easy way to say to your coaches as well, rather than firing figures and numbers at them. Um, the standards that you do choose will um, depend on a few different things, like the sport, the levels played on, um, and even the training age of the athlete. And um, one thing I will say, just to make your test run relatively smooth, is ensure that you educate your athletes. So let them know what the different protocols are, make sure they know what they're doing, and that they're comfortable with all the different tests. And as well as this, I always, always, always promote a really strong self-focus. They just need to focus on themselves, especially if they're doing something like a Bronco test. If their attention drifts, they can end up missing a turn, doing an extra turn. And it's just really not ideal. Um, so they just, you just need to promote this self-focus, just say to them, look, concentrate on yourself, concentrate on your running, um, even spread it across the pitch if you need to, if that's gonna help. But that's something I always promote, it's just this really strong self-focus. And then these are just some of the tests that I've done. So this is obviously just another screenshot from that spreadsheet. Um, so I have the kind of aim of the test. So aerobic, anaerobic, and um, power speed acceleration. That's what the kind of aim is. Um, and then I have um, the type of, so the test, the actual test that we do, and then any equipment that we need, because I always find if I'm doing a testing day, I'm always leaving the house and I'm always running through like, okay, doing a Bronco test, what do I need? The cones, measuring tape, my tripod on my phone, stopwatch, whistle, notebook, um, just running through things in my head. And when you have it written down, it just either solidifies it in your mind or it means that if you're like, oh God, I need to get a test, what do I need again? That you can just go back and be like, yeah, have it, yeah, check. And that's it done. So it's just a really, really easy way of doing this. So you can see I have this for kind of like pitch-based um, 
tests or like say like the power stuff and I don't really have it for strength that's because um strength testing is a little bit easier generally whenever I've done it we're just in the gym but say if it's in maybe a new facility um then I'd either go check out the facility beforehand then do a little checklist um or do just do something like that and um, just make sure you don't need to bring anything with you um but yeah just I think this is really useful just so that we break everything down we know what we're doing we know what we need for that and it's just all set out so by now we've gone through our needs analysis we've gone through our movement screening and we've gone through our testing so we know the athletes really well and we know the sport really well but I suppose um the question kind of is like where do we go from here or what do I do now I've done all these steps so the next step is planning your calendar so your calendar is definitely your best friend when it comes to programming and when you have things pre-planned it does allow you to change things if needs be so i say here sketch out the year or however long you have with the athletes whether maybe it's six months here you would um mark in the different times you have with them maybe if it's interrupted by holidays or at different times in years in a year for me um working with school teams things like Christmas break exams like they'll all come into play they'll affect uh, our training so it, it could mean that the players miss maybe two weeks of their SNC so I just keep that in mind block that off in the calendar when you're uh, planning your time out with them then I would go um, pop in or try to sketch out approximate season dates if you're very far in advance um, you might know the exact dates, but just maybe going off the previous year, you'll know kind of a rough, a rough date, start date and a rough finish date. I then pop in the competition dates if you know them. So when the league, the cup or the championship starts, um, maybe even if it's the first league match, you can just put that in if you know that or if you know roughly when that'll be, just pop that in. And then once I've done that part of the calendar planning, you can kind of start to work at putting in things like testing dates, when their gym sessions will be, when their conditioning sessions will be, just things like that. Um, and it's just good to plan out that kind of time because we do know that our job isn't done when preseason ends. Well, more often than not, we will be working with a team through the season. So we do need to plan for an extended um period of time which is where that calendar comes in now of course having your calendar planned out is amazing and in an ideal world everything will go according to plan but unfortunately there are so many reasons why your plans might be interrupted whether that is because of covid which i don't know about anyone else but that has definitely wreaked havoc on different plans that i've had for teams or maybe if it's even the weather, if there's a, a weather warning and it's preventing you from training outside or you can't go to the facility. So it's basically comes back to, we can't live and die by the calendar. We need to be adaptable to any situation that comes our way and having different things planned out, it, like, it means that if things are delayed, so we have it all laid out, if things are delayed, we can just delay things by another week or so. We can just shift things on. So yes, Having things planned out really well is really, really good. And we, we aim for that. But don't get too bogged down if those plans are interrupted or if it doesn't go the way that you kind of saw it going. And then I did just want to put a visual to this. So you'll probably recognize this image um, if you come to it. And if not, um, you will see this in your SNC case study. So this is just the blank calendar um, I start with. Your case study one is blue, mine is pink, um, just because I used to work, I used to use the same thing with the boys team. So I just had one pink and one blue just for, so I could easily see on the Google Docs that, oh, this is the girls team one. Um, so this is a blank calendar. I've only screenshot as far as August because I just wanted to give me an idea of what I've said over the last little while. Um, but yeah, so we start with the blank calendar. I then block off times that will interrupt training. So you can see here in the yellow, so I've blocked off these weeks here because the girls have um, school exams, so there won't be any training um, at all. Then we come back in and we actually train through June. So they'll be in the school training. 
and then I've blocked off this um, section in July into green because uh, they get a bit of a, a time off, but they will be training from home. So you can see I've put in this kind of training camp section, um, TFH, train from home, um, which I'm sure we're all really familiar with that little acronym over the last year of COVID. Um, but yeah, they'll be training from home. And then you can see I've blocked off the bank holiday there as well. And then they'll be coming into training after the bank holiday. So I just block that off so I know what's coming up and I know what I have to plan or I know what I have to work around. And then after doing that, um, I pop in all the days that they'll be on the pitch and in the gym. So you can see the unit counts um, and then also the actual days. Um, and I just, I just do that so I know when actual sessions will be or when, um, what I'll be doing on those days. And that just makes the programming a little bit easier so I know what to plan for. And of course that might change as the year goes on, but at least if you have it done, it's quite easy to change. And then once I do that, I put in the testing days. So the coaches I work with, they really like testing and they like staying on top of things and just monitoring the athletes because some of the girls will play other sports. So it's a good way of making sure that they're still, like when it comes to testing day, that there should be still improvement. And if not, then there might be a little bit of an issue. Um, but yeah, we put in all the, the um, testing days. This is what will happen in an ideal world. Um, but we'll see, I suppose, over the next couple of months how that goes. Um, but it means that, say, if this first testing date, that was back in April, say if that had to get delayed by a week, it means I could just knock on all these other tests by a week quite easily. I would just shift them over. And it does, it does make it kind of easy as well. Once you've done this, then um, obviously you'll have the whole calendar. Once you've popped in all your tests, I would then go putting in your match days um, if you know when they are or kind of the approximate time and maybe when you want to do certain type of training. Um, but that's just to give you an idea of the process it's, it starts kind of from those little steps. So just to recap on the checklist there. First, we carry out our needs analysis. <clears throat> then we screen our athletes. We then test our athletes. And then we plan the calendar. And remember that step one to three is about all about creating context for your program. So the sport you're programming for and also the context surrounding your athletes. And then once you've done these steps, we know our sport, we know our athlete, and we've planned out our calendar, it's time to actually write the programme. And before we actually design what our day-to-day -day will look like, we need to decide what kind of adaptation or what we want to focus on and when we want to do that. So whether that is fundamental, general physical prep, strength dominant phase, power dominant phase, you just divide out your time into blocks. And once you've done that, then you can get to the fun part, which is designing the actual sessions on the day to day. So I've just taken that calendar and gone kind of a step on. And I've just put in just at the top there, kind of what the focus for each block will be. You can see that this block is quite long, but that's because we're going into the train from home. So training is going to be uh, kind of adapted to just stuff they're able to do at home. Um, and because I do work with school level athletes yours might look very different to this um but basically because i work at school level athletes they're not at the stage where they need power work or where, the, where they'll actually benefit from power work so my focus tends to shift towards movement quality and technique general physical prep and then developing basic strength i stick to that because that's what they need and what they're going to really benefit from um, rather than introducing things that they're not really going to benefit from hugely. So when you are doing this, you just need to keep in mind your athletes and their training age, their biological age, and their actual level of training as well. As well as this, things are going to kind of vary depending on the time of the year, um, what you want to focus on, what your athletes need to focus on, that kind of thing. Maybe if your coach... Um, needs a certain thing your, your things are going to shift as well according to that so once we've done that then we get into the day-to-day -day. and I'm just going to run through this really briefly because 
we do go through it on our online platform as well but it's just so that I don't kind of stop early and you're like wait what like then what do I do so I just want to go through the whole the whole process I suppose but we won't spend too long on this system because I think we should already know and if not we will know from the from the platform so this is when our PAA system comes in when we're designing our day-to-day -day stuff so as you know, when we program, we use our primary assistance and accessory block approach. And here's a session I typically use with my players, and this reflects that um, PAA system. So our primary exercise is our box squat, focusing on developing strength by using that lower rep scheme. Um, and I just have a filler exercise in their passive squat, um, just for a bit of mobility work. And then to assist this, we use our posterior chain dominant exercise, and that is our ordeal. This is supposed to get stronger in the squat, but also because of posterior strength, posterior chain strength, so important for athletes. It's going to help um, them with the capacity to run faster and sprint faster. And it's also been shown to protect um, and keep the ankle, knee and hip joints healthy and help to reduce injury risks. And then just in my accessory work, I focus on hypertrophy. So we're keeping the rep slightly higher. So that's what kind of a lot of my sessions will look like when we're in that um, basic strength uh, development. <clears throat> but if you were to kind of work with maybe a more advanced athlete, your approach will slightly change. But before um, you get to that phase, the according to like the UK SCA, to involve power work and to like advance your athletes on, you need to make sure that our athletes are strong enough and this is when they can squat one and a half times their body weight, when they can bench their body weight, and when they can do a body weight pull up. So of course, if your athletes get to the stage when they are ready enough, um, then we could progress them to include power work in their session. And our order of exercise kind of shift. So we'll take a look at this here. And um, what happens basically is our primary exercise now becomes the power exercise. So you've added in the power exercise. And this is the first exercise that's done because it does require the highest drive from the CNS, so the central nervous system. Our assistance exercise is now what previously would have been um, our primary exercise. And because we want this to assist and keep us strong and help our power exercise improve, um, we would choose kind of one of the main movements. So like a squat, and then in our accessories block, I would include what would have previously been our assistance exercise alongside other accessories, like the regular kind of accessories we would have included before. So you can see I just adjusted that last session um, to if I was to include power. So my primary exercise is my power exercise. So we have a barbell squat jump. And because we're focusing on keeping that movement quick and powerful, I've just left it at a three by three. Then our assistance exercise is the general strength movement. So our box squat, and we're keeping that um, kind of sets and rep scheme in line with um, what we use for strength work. And I've just put that filter or filler exercise in there as well. So that passive squat. Then we get to the accessories. And you can see that I have the RDL there and that's our posterior chain dominant exercise which is gonna help our squat strength. But this time alongside that, we have our split squat, our glute bridge and our hollow hold, all at a higher rep scheme. So we have our hypertrophy focus for accessories as well. Um, and that's just to give you a snapshot at kind of what we would do. Um, I don't wanna focus on that too much because <coughs> the main focus of today's like webinar is to provide you with that checklist or the kind of guidelines before we get to the actual programming phase. But I didn't want to leave you kind of just hanging off the edge, being like, oh God, what do I do then? Um, but from there, that's the kind of flow that we would go or the route that we would take into programming. So that's all from me. Um, hopefully you can take away one thing, whether that is the checklist that I've spoke about or even how to lay different things out, um, like I've shown you in the last few images. Um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them now. Great, thanks for Black like Harris. So yeah, guys, if you have any questions, pop them in the question box below, and I'll run through them with Karen. Yeah.
but yeah, that was really interesting. So I suppose I've a couple of questions just geared towards coming back to the checklist. I think knowing the sport, having good knowledge of the sport is so underappreciated. Oh, definitely. So I, like, even when I have coaches, I usually recommend that they go play the sport. Obviously, they don't have to go join a team or go kind of the whole nine yards, but even to just play it. Like, so say, for example, hockey, you just get out a hockey stick, find some friends who play it, yeah. see what movement is like. So I remember when I first started coaching hockey, I just, like, I knew what position you'd be in, but you don't comprehend how long they spend in that one position um, until you three, maybe five, ten minutes, and then you just have a whole new appreciation of it. And it's such an important thing to factor into your programming as well. Yeah, even, like, with some of them, um, like, with some of the teams in school that I might be working with a couple for a bit of a long time, like, they have to run with their hockey sticks during the match, and running with a hockey stick is so different to regular running so like to get them kind of used to maybe sprinting with a hockey stick you just have to implement it so you'll only figure that out by actually trying it yourself by trying to run with a hockey stick or even with a gum shield in like it's you just have to kind of figure things out like that and when you're doing some of your conditioning work would you make sure they do it with with the stick yeah so i'll do like um shuttle runs to the 25 line um and they'll all like make them do it with their stick so they're getting used to turning quickly with their stick as well and kind of running at a pretty fast pace with them so they hate it but it's definitely has to be done <laughs> well, thank you for it <laughs> one day <laughs> yeah. i love seeing a calendar like drawn out Mm. Well, how so you program in, I suppose, leeway either side of things to allow for flexibility? Because, you know, there's a lot of, like, between coaches' decisions whether different things, you never, you're lucky if you get one month that follows the calendar, let alone well. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, you can kind of see things are, like, pretty spaced out, like, different testing is pretty spaced out. That does mean even, like, if a Bronco test meant to be six weeks apart and then it turns out to be five weeks apart, not that much in the difference. Um, but... Yeah, I would just always be like prepared to for that. Um and it doesn't like it make sure it's not a really rigid, rigid scheme. And then always have a backup as well. That's probably one thing I always like make sure I have just in my head a backup um session just in case. Even if the pitch space pitch space you thought you had, you don't actually have to just have a backup. Yeah, definitely. And what would be kind of some of the considerations that you do for you mentioned there pitch type would again these seem to be kind of very specific for hockey or hockey would have the greatest differential between them but how would you kind of factor in pitch in some of your conditioning or what would be the difference different approaches for different types of pitch i guess um i probably so it would probably come into um play when i was like maybe programming prehab work or like robustness work because so the girls that i train they predominantly train, there's two pitches in the school. There's a water-based pitch and then there's a sand pitch. So that they usually train on the water-based and it's actually like really soft. It's really bouncy. It's great for plyos if you're ever doing plyos on it. But then they go down to the sand pitch and it's really, really hard. And there's been times even after like one session of running on the sand pitch that they're all complaining about their shins and their knees like being sore. So I would just kind of like look at it and probably pro like program maybe um, exercises that could like help kind of help them like put up with the different surface or help them kind of cope with that different surface, different surface as well. Yeah, definitely. And again, you know yourself, if you play underneath the pitch, this is a huge difference. You'll feel kind of through the legs and your joints are different depending on the different pitches you play on. Yeah, like it's actually crazy. Like in the school, we have um, an all weather pitch that's like that typical, you know, the little black ball yeah. with, the, with the grass. We have one of them. Amazing. It's so soft. But then you go up to the sand pitch and you're like, this is like walking on a rock. And then you go up to the water pitch and it's really bouncy. So, like, there is a good bit of difference. And like, sometimes they will have to train on the all weather pitch, like for conditioning, um, which you just kind of need to. Like with that, they might slip more. You just need to be aware of kind of different surfaces, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. I suppose what strikes me most about that is like for a talk on programming, we only really got to the programming towards the very end, like the traditional people would pop into your head when you think about programming. Yeah. 
there's so much more to it than those like than just your BBA sessions that actually went into. So it's yeah. really cool to see how you approach that, and I think that's definitely underutilized in the industry, industry or definitely underappreciated. Yeah, I think so. And like I remember when I kind of started working with hockey, and like I'd have to program a session, like before I maybe like looked into actual sport. If you think about it, you'd be like kind of just stuck there, and you'd be like, oh my god, what, like what do I even do? Like I don't even know what they like how they play. Like I don't even know like what they need to do, and you just you kind of like freeze almost. So doing this is gonna kind of help with that whole process, and it definitely is. It's, it's the background work. I feel like being an SNC coach, even being a PT, um, it's all about the work that goes on in the background. Everyone yeah, else yeah. has a program, but we actually do a lot of work in the background. And I feel once you've, so it's, it's a lot of work at the start, but then next year it'll stand to you. And if you're, say, for one half year, if you're programming for rugby or soccer, then when you're coming back to hockey, it's so helpful to have that GG there rather than being like, Oh God, what did we wrong here? Yeah, what they need? What did I focus on this? Or when they to pack it in the stick and different things like that. But yeah. having that cheat sheet, like, this is what the sporting demands are. This year, we're going to so handy to look back on. Yeah, exactly. And then you'll, like, as well, because I just have it in the big, like, um, Google Sheet spreadsheet. Mm. And at the bottom, on one of the tabs, I have, like, the, the weeks done out in these, like, blocks. There's little blue blocks for the programming section of it. And it means that I can just scroll up and look at how we progress through the year and like maybe what we didn't really hit or diff- just different things. And it's just, it's, such, it's a, literally is a cheat, a cheat sheet for programming. Mm. Like sort it out for the next year. Definitely. And then, so, so you have programming, up, obviously screening was a big part of the year. Your days. Is there, I presume there will be people, is there certain minimal targets that you have to get the athletes hit before they can actually move on to to their strength work, to their conditioning work, just from kind of the general movement point of view? Yeah, so like, say when I get the players, um, say like, they come to me like in second year when they start off, and um, that kind of age, they're growing quite quickly, so they've got these Bambi legs, and like, they just, when you get them to squat, it's like, I, they, they could have been able to squat last year, and then they come to you and they try to squat, and they can't squat. So it definitely is like, I would just work on if, say, if it's a younger age group, if they're all really struggling with those movements, I would literally just regress it. Maybe if they're struggling with doing a bodyweight squat, do an assisted squat, like a ring assisted squat, drive that pattern and then progress it and progress it. So like another part of it is probably coming up with like a spreadsheet of progressions and regressions for each sort of movement and just being able to bring your athletes through those and like with the end goal being doing like a box squat but before that it might be a goblet squat like a bodyweight squat a banded squat just all the way up i'd have yeah definitely and i think having those regressions means you don't have to so say people who aren't moving so well you don't have to alienate them completely from the session they're still in the same session just yeah you know, the tone back version of the together moving right but they're not like on their own in a corner doing exactly just, like, sometimes as well when you find with them um, hockey players their upper body mobility is really poor so they actually can't back squat and mm-hmm. um, so what I've like done with some players or even if they're just not at that level yet just get them to do a goblet box squat and they're still getting a similar stimulus and just mm-hmm. but they're still doing the session yeah, all right guys if there's no more questions coming in Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Carla. That was really good, really interesting. Thank you. Someone so organized. What's been a shame? I know. <laughs> I know. It's probably a bit overboard. <laughs> <laughs> Better to do Sorry. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thanks for meeting, guys. And when you're tuning out, just make sure to leave us some feedback. Let us know if there's anything, any webinars you'd like to see in the future, anything you'd like to see from us in general. But other than that, thank you so much. Hope you have a great day. See you guys. Thanks so much.